let us then have a word of prayer as uh, we start the presentation. Our Heavenly Father, we want to say thank you for the Sabbath that you have given unto us. As we study your work during this uh, Vespers, I pray that uh, our minds may be enlightened according to thy will and speak to us and the things that seem so difficult, make them be understandable at this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. And so uh, I welcome you once again in this uh, presentation. It has been a journey. And uh, this is uh, the 23rd presentation. We have two more to go on justification by faith. This time we shall be looking on uh, Jesus' temptations, how he was tempted, and then uh, during the Sabbath uh, daylight, we shall be looking at how he overcame, and then we will crown it all in the afternoon Bible study on uh, the closing remarks. And so I pray that these last three presentations will be a blessing to us. Uh, looking at uh, Minneapolis and the aftermath of uh, everything, how he was tempted. Uh, I'd like us to look uh, at something on the temptations of Jesus Christ, how he was tempted. And, uh, sorry. how he was tempted. The, the set, uh, the book of Matthew chapter 25 is so interesting uh, for those who have been studying the word of God. The setting is so interesting. When Jesus came on this earth and uh, was uh, taken in the wilderness of uh, a temptation. This is what we read. This is uh, what we read, when Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted, he was led by the Spirit of God. He was led by the Spirit of God. He did not go there by his own accord, but it was the Spirit which had prepared him for the temptation that were uh, before him. He did not invite temptation. He went into the wilderness to be alone, to be to contemplate his mission and work by fasting and praying. He was to brace himself for the bloodstained path he must travel. But Satan knew that the Savior had gone into the wilderness, and he thought this was the best time to approach him. Weak and emaciated from hunger, worn and haggard with mental agony, Christ's visage was so mad, more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Now was Satan's opportunity. Now he supposed that he could overcome Christ. And so we find that uh, when Christ went into the uh, wilderness of temptation, uh, actually the visage was mad. The glory that uh, many supposed that he had at that point was not there. His visage was uh, mad more than any man. His visage was mad more than any man. That is what we read. And then we are told Christ that Christ could have worked a miracle. Christ could have worked a miracle. Sorry. in his own behalf, but this will not have been in according with the plan of salvation. The many miracles in the life of Jesus show his power to work miracles for the benefit of suffering humanity. 
And by the way, we are looking at how he was tempted and we are looking at the setting of Matthew chapter four. By a miracle of mercy, he fed 5,000 at once with five loaves and two small fishes. Therefore, he had the power to work a miracle and satisfy his own hunger. Satan plotted himself that he could lead Christ to doubt the word spoken from heaven at his baptism. If he could tempt him to question his sonship and doubt the truth of the word spoken by his father, he will gain a uh, victory. So in this temptation, in the setting of the temptation, we see that uh, Satan thought that if he could make Christ doubt the word spoken from heaven at his baptism. So what are the words that were spoken to Jesus Christ at baptism? And Jesus, when he was baptized, went out straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So in this setting of temptations in uh, Matthew chapter 4, we find that the temptation of Jesus Christ centered upon his sonship. And uh, this, the temptation of Jesus Christ centered upon his sonship. He told, never before had angels listened to such a prayer as Christ offered at his baptism, and they were, solic they were solicitors to be the bearers of the message from the Father to his Son. But no, direct from the Father issues the light of his glory. Um, the heavens were open and beams of glory rested upon the Son of God and assumed the form of a dove in appearance like a burnished gold. The dove-like form was emblematical of uh, the meekness and uh, gentleness of Christ. While the people stood spellbound with amazement, their eyes fastened upon Christ. From the opening heavens came these words, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The words of confirmation that Christ is the Son of God was given to inspire faith in those who witnessed the sin and sustain the Son of God in his odious work. Notwithstanding the Son of God was clothed with humanity, yet Jehovah with his own voice assured him of his sonship with the eternal. In this manifestation to his Son, God accepts humanity as exalted through the excellence of his beloved Son. And so in the, in the, in the temptation of Jesus Christ, you found that the, the main object of Satan was to make Christ doubt his sonship, was to make Christ doubt his sonship. And if he would make him doubt his sonship, then he could prompt him to do something that was against, uh, that was against uh, the, the plan of redemption. Continued on, we are told that after the baptism of Jesus in Jordan, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. The Holy Spirit had fitted for that special sin of fierce temptation. Forty days he was tempted of the devil, and in those days he ate nothing. Everything around Jesus was unpleasant, from which human nature would be led to shrink. He was with the wild beast and the devil in a desolate, lonely place. I saw that the Son of God was pale and emaciated through fasting and suffering, but his course was marked out, and he must fulfill the work he came to do. And so in the garden, uh, in, 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 in the wilderness of temptation, we, we always think that um, it was only after Christ had fasted 40 days that he was tempted of the devil. But we shall see that he was tempted actually the 40 days he was in the wilderness, not after the 40 days. Uh, and why was he being tempted? Satan was seeking a dispute with Jesus concerning his being the son of God. Imagine angels were, were expelled from heaven. I, we, we shall read that because they could obscure Christ was the Son of God. Now, the, the battle that uh, was started in heaven was extended here on earth. And that is why we are being told Satan was seeking a dispute with Jesus concerning his being the Son of God. He referred to his weak suffering condition and boasting affirmed that he was stronger than Jesus. Can you imagine that? But the word spoken from heaven, thou art my beloved Son, in the I am well pleased was sufficient to sustain Jesus through uh, all his sufferings. I saw that in all his mission, he had nothing to do in convincing Satan of his power and of his being the savior of the world. Satan had sufficient evidence of his exalted station and authority 
his unwillingness to yield to Jesus' authority shut him out of heaven. Now look at this. In the wilderness of temptation, the main focus of Satan is disputing the sonship of Jesus Christ. And Christ does not go into proving he is the son of God. And then the, the Satan is trying like, to tell him that, you see, you are not the son of God. And to prove that, we are told, Satan to to manifest his strength, carried Jesus to Jerusalem, sun himself carried away on the screen. You can see Christ in white robe, and then uh, behind him is a, a, a figure, his legs extending downwards, carrying Jesus Christ. He carried him to the great mountain in Jerusalem and set him upon a pinnacle of the temple and again tempted him, that if he was the son of God, to give him evidence of it by casting himself down from the dizzy height upon which he had placed him. Satan came with the words of inspiration, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up lest at any time you dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Satan wished to cause Jesus to presume upon the mercy of his father and risk his life before the fulfillment of his mission. He had hoped that the plan of salvation would fail, but I saw that the plan was laid too deep to be thus overthrown or marred by Satan. And, and they were taking him up into the high mountain showed him showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and the devil said unto him all this power will i give thee and the glory of them for that is delivered unto me and to whosoever i'll give it if thou therefore will worship me all shall be thine and jesus answered and said unto him get thee behind me satan for it is written thou shalt worship the lord thy god and him only shall thou serve welcome those who are coming in we are looking at um, how was Jesus Christ tempted? What, what was the reason of his temptation and how uh, is it of uh, effectual, effect, uh, uh, effectual uh, uh, purpose in our lives? We, are, we, we, we just started, so you are not late. And um, the devil to show that uh, he was stronger than Jesus Christ, he carried him to Jerusalem and that then he carries him to the mountain. And we are told he bore Jesus to the top of the building high mountain. You see that? And then in a para panoramic view presented before him all the kingdoms of the world that had been so long under his dominion and offered them to him in one great gift. He told Christ that he could come into possession of all those kingdoms without suffering or peril. Satan promises to yield his scepter and dominion and to make Christ the rightful ruler for one favor from him. All he requires in return for making over to him the kingdoms of the world that they presented before him is that Christ shall do him homage as to a superior. And so, the battle has been ever worshipped and it will continue to be worshipped. Look at this. Tempter offered to Christ the kingdom and glory of the world. He was proposing that Christ should yield up the real kingship of the world and hold dominion subject to Satan. This was the same dominion upon the hopes of the Jews who are said. They desire the kingdom of this world. If Christ had consented to offer them such a kingdom, they would gladly have received him. But the curse of sin with all it is who rested upon it. Christ declared to the tempter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him alone thou shalt serve. So, actually, in the temptation of Christ worshipping him, what Satan wanted to do is not Christ to be given the kingdom, but to yield up the scepter to him. And when we actually, um, uh, when, when we actually get um, involved in... Uh, worshiping satan what we do we are actually forfeiting our dominion to him we are not gaining anything but uh, we are forfeiting our dominion unto him this is what he wanted christ to do and, uh, satan had questioned whether jesus was the son of god the temptations that upon his sonship whether in heaven or on earth in his summary uh dismissed soul he had Proof that he could not gain say. Divinity flies through suffering humanity. Satan had no power to resist the command. Right? Writing with humiliation and rage, he was forced to withdraw from the presence of the world's redeemer. Christ's victory was a complete, as complete as uh, had been the failure of Adam. Yeah, at last, Christ In the desolate wilderness, Christ was not 
in so favorable a position to endure the temptation of Satan as was Adam when he was tempted in Eden. Uh, sometimes uh, we, we look at um, the temptations of Jesus Christ and some have said that Christ was able to overcome because he was the divine son of God. And um, it's like saying that he used his divinity to overcome the temptations. But uh, we want to see, we want to dwell deeply in this issue did Christ use his divinity to overcome? First of all, we find that Christ was not in so favorable a position to endure the temptation of Satan as was Adam when he was tempted in Eden. So Adam was in a more favorable position than when Christ was in the, uh, in the, temptation of, the wilderness of temptation. The Son of God humbled himself and took man's nature after the race had wandered 4,000 years from Eden and from the original state of purity and uprightness. Sin had been making it is terrible marks upon the race for ages, and physical, mental, and moral degeneracy prevailed throughout the human family. When Adam was assailed by his tempter in Eden, he was without the taint of sin. He stood before God in the strength of a perfect manhood. All the organs and faculties of his being were equally developed and harmoniously balanced. That is Adam before the fall. Now look at Jesus Christ. When he came in the wilderness of temptation, of what kind of a person was he? Christ in the wilderness of temptation stood in Adam's place to bear the test he failed to endure. Here Christ overcame in the sinner's behalf 4,000 years after Adam turned his back upon the light of his home. Separated from the presence of God, the human family had been departing each successive generation further from the original purity, wisdom, and knowledge which Adam possessed in Eden. Now mark these words in yellow. Christ bore the sins and the infirmities of the race as they existed when he came to the earth to help man. This is the nature that Christ had, brothers and sisters. In behalf of the race, with the weaknesses of fallen man upon him, he was to stand the temptation of Satan upon all points on which man could be assailed. So Christ in his humanity, in his nature that he, uh, he possessed when he came to this world, which is human nature, with, it is all weakness, he had to withstand Satan with that nature not another nature. As soon as so think about incarnation, what happened at incarnation? And think what happened at, at the baptism of Jesus Christ, the glory of God overshadowed him in the emblematic form of a dove. But soon after he came out of that water, after the glory had overshadowed him, we are told as soon as Christ entered the wilderness of temptation, his visage changed. What kind of visage change? The glory and splendor which were reflected from the throne of God and his countenance when the heavens opened before him and the father's voice acknowledged him as his son in whom he was well pleased were now gone. Were now gone. I found the, the, the statement is overwhelming to me. It is so touching that uh, when Christ just came from the, the waters of baptism, all that glory that uh, had overshadowed him in the form of the dove was now gone. And he was left without anything to aid him to uh, recall that he was the son of God. He was to suffer as human beings suffer without being enshrined with any glory that will give him any strength to endure the temptation. He was to tread the wine press alone as a man. It was gone. The weight of the sins of the world was pressing his soul and his countenance expressed utterable sorrow, a depth of anguish that fallen men had never realized since day one of his uh, 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 days in the wilderness. A depth of anguish that fallen man has never realized. He felt the overwhelming tide of woe that deluged the world. He realized that strength of indulged appetite and unholy passion which controlled the world and had brought upon man inexpressible suffering. Look at Luke chapter 2 four verses to being 40 days tempted of the devil. He was not tempted after the 40 days, but since day one, when the glory departed from him, he was tempted 40 days in the wilderness. In those days, he did eat nothing. Confrontation page 38, paragraph two. As soon as the long fast of Christ commenced, you catch that? Satan was at hand with his temptations. He did not wait after 40 days. As soon as he went in the wilderness, he, was, he started to be tempted. He came to Christ and shrouded in light, claiming to be one of the angels from the throne of God. Sent upon an errand of mercy to sympathize with him, 
and to relieve him of his suffering condition. He tried to make Christ believe that God did not require him to pass through the self-denial and suffering he anticipated, that he had been sent from heaven to bear to him the message that God only designed to prove his willingness to endure. So Satan comes in the wilderness of temptation and tells Christ, you see, you don't have to go through temptations. The father just wanted to know if you can come down from heaven and be able to be a sacrifice for men. But now you don't have to go through this. And then he reminds him of Abraham and uh, Isaac when Abraham wanted to sacrifice Isaac. And he, he tells him, you see, Abraham did not end up sacrificing Isaac. And so you don't have to go through this. The father doesn't want you to go through through this. This is the arch deceiver coming to our Savior Jesus Christ and wanting to end the plan of redemption. As soon as uh, the long fast of, of Christ commenced, Satan was at hand with his temptation. And uh, we see that uh, he wanted to tempt Jesus Christ to doubt that he had to go through all uh, the. Looking at the set and how he was tempted. Mark chapter 1, verse 13. He was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan and was with the wild beasts. Now, I want you to think about the setting of Jesus Christ, 40 days being tempted and with the wild beast as a man, not as a divine person, not using his divine power, a divine being, yes, but not using his divine power. With all the frailty of humanity, he was there. When Christ bore the test of temptation upon the point of appetite, he did not stand in beautiful Eden as did Adam, with the light and love of God seen in everything his eye rested upon, but he was in a barren, desolate wilderness and surrounded with the wild beasts. Everything around him was repulsive. With these surroundings, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And in those days, he did eat nothing. He was emaciated through long fasting and felt the keenest sense of hunger. His visage was indeed mad more than the sons of men. You think that your life has been so hard? You think that uh, there are some things that you can't go through in your life? Sometimes we come to a point we think that uh, uh, there is something that uh, we go through that Christ never went through. But no brothers and sisters, Christ failed the most uh, 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 depth of temptation that any man can go through. No one will be ever tempted like Jesus Christ was tempted. I believe there is no one who can go through even what Christ went through. We are told, Satan told Christ that he was to set his feet in the blood sand path, but not to travel it. That like Abraham, he was toasted to show his perfect obedience. He also stated that he was the angel that stayed the hand of Abraham as the knife was raised to slay Isaac. Imagine. And he had now come to save his life. That it was not necessary for him to endure this painful hunger and death from starvation, and that he would help him bear the work in the plan of salvation. Now, you will find that... Uh, Satan is a deceiver and that is what he is. Because here he tells Jesus Christ that he has been sent to save him from all this. But uh, look at the next um, thing that he tells Jesus Christ. In confrontation page 40, uh, he tells Jesus Christ uh, that Satan told Christ that one of the exalted angels had been thrown to the earth, that his appearance indicated that instead of his being the king of heaven, he was the angel fallen and that this explained his emaciated and distressed appearance. In the previous slide, we have seen that he told him that um, he is an angel that has been sent to save him. He didn't have to go all through this, but he have come to save him. He don't have, he don't have to go through this temptation. Now, in the next slide, we are being told that he told Jesus Christ that Christ is the fallen angel. Satan is a liar. He will always be a liar and there is nothing in truth that he speaks. He abode not in truth. And that is what he will be always. And those who serve him will always be liars. I really challenge you, if you are used to lies, you better think of who is inspiring you. Satan flattered himself that he could lead Christ to doubt the words spoken from heaven at his baptism. If he could tempt him to question his sonship, and doubt the truth of the word spoken by his father, he will gain a great victory. So if Christ in one moment he could ever have doubt that he was the son of God, the word spoken at the baptism, then our redemption is gone. He then called the attention of Christ to his own attractive appearance, clothed with the light and strong in power. He claimed to be a messenger direct from the throne of heaven. 
and asserted that he had a right to demand Christ's evidence of his being the son of God. What a sorry state. Now here is Christ in humanity, and this tempter, who is the fallen angel, is tounding him to show evidence that he is the son of God, and he thinks now he is stronger than the commander of all the hosts of heaven. Satan would fain disbelieve he could. If he would, the words that came from heaven to the son of God as his baptism. So the main uh, strength in Satan's temptation lied in Christ doubting his sonship. And look, he wanted to obscure that in the wilderness of temptations. The same thing he obscured in heaven this day with God, page 128, paragraph 2. Angels were expelled from heaven because they will not work in harmony with God. They fell from their high estate because they wanted to be exalted. They had come to exalt themselves. And they forgot that their beauty of person and of character came from the Lord Jesus. This fact, the fallen angels would obscure that Christ was the only begotten son of God. And they came to consider that they were not to consult Christ. He then called the attention of Christ to his own attractive appearance and asserted that he had a right to demand of Christ evidence of his being the son of God. You see how those temptations were centered upon his sonship. Continued on, we are told Christ knew that Satan was uh, 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 Christ knew that Satan was a liar from the beginning and it required strong self-control. And this is what we are required of even today. Uh, that is strong self-control to listen to the propositions of insulting deceiver and not instantly rebuke his bold assumption. When we are uh, getting some information from people and we know very well that they are even lying, we don't have to enter into controversy with them or to insult them or to rebuke them at such a time. We have to let them roll their story. And after rolling their story, we can reflect upon it and see the way we can approach it. Satan was expecting that the Son of God would, in his extreme weakness and agony of spirit, give him an opportunity to obtain advantage over him by provoking him to engage in controversy with him. And many a times when we are tempted, we try to, en to enter into a provoking conversation with those who are tempting us. This is not the right time to enter into those uh, uh, controversies, but to let everything cool down. And then after getting our composure, now we can answer back with the a wisdom that God gives unto us. He designed to pervert the words of Christ and claim advantage and call to his aid his fallen angels to use their utmost power to prevail against and overcome him. Jesus did not condescend to explain to his enemy how he was the son of God and in what manner as such he was to us. Sometimes we belabor to explain how Christ is the son of God. A symbol statement Christ is the only begotten Son of God will do it. Yet sometimes we enter into controversy until we waste our time. I say sometimes. There are sometimes when genuine questions will require genuine answers, but there's sometimes unwise questions and ungenuine questions should not preoccupy our times. Uh, we are told that if we we'll dedicate our time in answering our critics, that is how Satan wants it, and he will multiply uh, more. Uh, critics and our pens will be busy, but not for saving souls, but for answering critics. So Jesus did not condescend to explain to his enemy how he was the son of God. How beautiful is that? Because Satan himself knew that he was the son of God and by Christ explaining anything to Satan, he was wasting time when souls were actually uh, being uh, deceived in other things. In insulting, taunting manner, Satan referred to the present weakness and distress appearance of Christ in contrast with his own strength and glory. He taunted Christ with being a poor representative of the angels, much less, much less of the exalted commander, the acknowledged king in the royal courts, and that his present appearance indicated that he was forsaken of God and man. He said that if Christ was indeed the Son of God, the monarch of heaven, he had power equal with God. Now, I hope you are catching these phrases. If Christ is really the begotten Son of God, then what is he? He had power equal with God. So the sonship of Jesus Christ makes him equal in omnipotence with God. Satan knew this very well. And if Satan knows, what is preventing Christian to know about it? And he could give him evidence of this and relieve his hunger by working a miracle, by changing the stone just at 
is fit into bread. Saturn promised that if Christ will do this, he will at once yield his claims of superiority and that the context between himself and Christ should there be forever entered. So if Christ will do any miracle to prove that he is the son of God, Saturn says that there the context will end and with Christ will end and Christ will be the supreme being. But no, that is not the thing. If Christ could have done that, it will have not been the rising of Jesus Christ, but the falling of Jesus Christ. Satan calculated his steps very well. He calculates them and he gets us these days. We are provoked a little bit and we are tempted to show that who we are and then we show it and then we enter into a fallen state. And that is how Satan actually gains advantage upon us. And so Luke chapter 4 verse 13 says in various versions, until an opportune time came, so after this temptation, after this scenario in the book of Matthew chapter 4, we are told, and when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. That is the King James Version, the lighter version. And NIV says, when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left until an opportune time. And New Living Translation, when the devil has finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. And we shall see this next opportunity when we shall be looking how uh, he overcame and uh, the, 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 the scene at uh, Calvary and at the, the, the judgment hall. This is, this is the opportune time that came again for Satan to tempt Jesus Christ to give up uh, the, the, the plan of redemption. And so this of Ages, page 131 says, uh, after the forehead departed, Jesus fell exhausted to the earth with the uh, parlor of death upon his face. The angels of heaven had watched the conflict beholding their loved commander as he passed through inexpressible suffering to make a way of escape for us. He had endured the test greater than we shall ever be called to endure. No man in this earth will be ever be called to endure or to go through what Christ went through. The servant is not greater than the master. If they did this to the son of God, what shall they do unto thee? But no temptation has come over you that is greater than what Christ went through. The angels now ministered to the Son of God and they shall minister unto us as he lay like one dying. He was strengthened with food, comforted with the message of his father's love and the assurance that all heaven triumphed in his victory. After 40 days, after the glory had departed from him in the, in the wilderness of temptation, warning, warming to life again, his great heart goes out in sympathy for man and he goes forth to complete the work he has begun to rest, not until the foe is vanquished and our fallen race is redeemed. Hallelujah. So did Jesus have emotional encounters such as the temptation to doubt, fear, presumption, love of vanity, youthful desires which are temptations simulated from within from a fallen nature? Was Jesus so, so tempted to express his will to do any of these sins? Let us examine the evidence there. And where else can we go? Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2. Temptation to doubt and fear. Even doubt assailed the dying Son of God. He could not see through the portals of the tomb. Are you assailed with the temptation of doubt? Jesus Christ was assailed with the same. Don't give up. He never gave up. And even though he could not see through the portals of tomb, he still held on the hand of omnipotence. He still held on his Father. No temptation has ever come to man that Christ never went through. Bright hope did not present to him his coming forth from the tomb as a conqueror and his father's acceptance of his sacrifice. In fact, we are told that um, um, in the tomb, Christ was a prisoner of hope. He never knew that the resurrection will be there, but he held on the promise of his father that if he would go through without sin, he would come up. But when he went through the portals of uh, of, uh, of suffering and in the tomb, he was there a prisoner allotted for a time to come out of, of, of that uh, prisoner. And then uh, uh, we are told that uh, he was tempted to fear that sin was so offensive in the sight of his father that he could not be reconciled to his son. The fierce temptation that his own father had forever left him caused the piercing cry from the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So Christ was tempted with doubt. He was tempted with fear. But in all this, he did not yield to the demands of these temptations. It is not sin to be tempted. 
it is only seen when we uh, uh, we participate in the final act of doubt and fear by doing something christ would have said okay forever i'm not going through all this suffering let me go back to heaven i have done my best but he never did that temptation to presumption the sin of presumption lies close beside the virtue of perfect faith and confidence in god Satan flattered himself that he could take advantage of the humanity of Christ to urge him over the line of trust to presumption. Upon this point, many souls are raped. Satan tried to deceive Christ through flattery. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 283. He then urged Christ to give him one more proof of his entire deception. He then urged Christ to give him One more proof of his entire dependence upon God. One more evidence of his faith that he was the son of God by casting himself from the temple. Satan's object in tempting Christ was to lead him to daring presumption and to show human weakness that would not make him a perfect pattern for his people. This, Christ was also tempted. Presumption. Temptation to vanity. Was Christ tempted with vanity? This last temptation was the most alluring of the three. Satan knew that Christ's life must be one of sorrow, hardship, and conflict, and he thought he could take advantage of this fact to bribe Christ to yield his integrity. Satan brought all his strength to bear upon his last temptation, for this last effort was to decide his destiny as to who should be the victim. And uh, we are told he claimed the word as his. He claimed the word as his dominion. Let me do something. Thank you. So he claimed. The world as he do, his dominion and he was the prince of the power of the air. He bore Jesus to the top of exceeding high mountain and then in a panoramic view presented before him all the kingdoms of the world that had been so long under his dominion and offered them to him in great gift. He told Christ he could come into possession of the kingdoms of the world without suffering or failing in his part. Temptation to vanity. Christ was tempted for vanity. Temptation... Uh, Satan promises to yield his scepter and dominion and Christ shall be rightful ruler of for one favor from him. All he requires in return for making over to him the kingdom of the world that they presented before him is that Christ shall do homage as to a spirit. The eye of Jesus for a moment rested upon the glory presented before him, but he turned away and refused to look upon the entrancing spectacle. He will not endanger his steadfast integrity by dealing with the tempter. You see, many times we are overcome with, um, the, with temptation because we keep on dialing upon the things that are presented before us. Once tempted to do this, we should turn away as Christ turned away from these things that uh, were supposed uh, to pond upon. If we are brought in the same crisis that Christ was brought, and many times we are brought in this crisis, Instead of lingering upon this, we should turn away. Eve lingered upon the tree and she fell into sin. Vanity is one of the strangest principles of a fallen nature, and Satan is constantly appealing to it with success. Review and Herald, uh, May 26, 1885, paragraph 7. Tempted as a child. Was Christ tempted as a child? Jesus was interested in children. He did not step into our world a fully matured man. Had he done this, children will not have his example to copy. So even little children can copy an example of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, we are told that he grew in stature, in wisdom, in favor with God, and in favor with man. 
meaning that he was obedient to God and to his parents. And children can copy his example. Christ was a child. He had the experience of a child. What experiences do children have, brothers and sisters? He felt the disappointments and trials that the children feel. Did he react? First Peter tells us that when he was tempted, when he was reviled, he did not revile back. When he was accused, he never opened his lips. He knew the temptation of the children and youth, but Christ was in, in his child life and youthful life, an example to all children and youth. And uh, I'd like to find something so quick about Jesus Christ as a child, how he was able to overcome as a child. It is so something interesting that uh, I read and uh, it, it, it really caught up uh, my, my mind. It should be this should be in uh, youth instructor. Let me try to share this. Jesus Christ as a child. How was he able to overcome as a child? I hope, uh, Sister Naomi, you can see my screen and the others watching here in Zoom. It says, no one looking upon the child-like countenance shining with animation could say that Christ was just like other children. He was God in human flesh. When urged by his companions to do wrong, divinity flies to humanity and he refused decidedly. In which way was he able to refuse? In a moment he distinguished between right and wrong and placed sin in the light of God's commandment. Holding up the law as a mirror which reflected light upon wrong. He did not use his divinity to overcome sin, but through the reflection of the commandments of God, he could put sin in its rightful place. Yet his appeals and entreaties and the sorrow expressed in his countenance revealed such a tender, honest love for them that they were ashamed of having tempted him to deviate from his strict sense of justice and loyalty. So as a child, he was tempted with other children to commit sin but he placed the commandments of God at the forefront and not divinity at the forefront. This is how we are supposed to overcome. This is Jesus Christ as a child. If you have hardship, so had he. If you have conflict, so had he. If you need encouragement, so did he. Satan could tempt him. His enemies could annoy him. The ruling powers could torture his body. The soldiers could crucify him and they can do more to us. 20 Mark 72.2. Jesus was sinless and had no dread of the consequences of sin. With this exception, his condition was as yours. You have not a difficulty that did not praise with equal weight upon him, not a sorrow that his heart was not, has not experienced. His feelings could be hurt with neglect, with indifference of professed friends as easily as yours. Is your path thorny? Christ was so intent for sense. Are you distressed? So was he. How well fitted was Christ to be an example? He was fitted to be an example to children, to the youth, and to the adults. You have not a difficult that did not praise the equal weight upon him. We are looking at the temptations of Jesus Christ. Not a sorrow that his heart has not experienced. This is a human being that went through all this, but he put the commandments of God at forefront. Jesus once stood in a just where you now stand. Have you been a child? Have you been a youth? Have you been an adult? Yes, he was. Your circumstances, your cogitations, at this period of your life, Jesus has said, he cannot overlook you at this critical period. He sees your dangers. He is acquainted with your temptation. He invites you to follow his example. Tempted as a youth, Jesus has said, suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me. Let no one place any obstruction in the way of the children coming to me. No, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus has passed through the trials and griefs to which childhood is subject. He knows the sorrows of the young. By his Holy Spirit, he is drawing the heart of the children to himself while Satan is working to keep them away from him. Review and Herald, December 17, 1889, paragraph 6. He was acquainted with the sorrows and temptation of childhood. 
He experienced the dangers and snares to which the youth are exposed, youth instructor. Yes, those who claim that it was not possible for Christ to sin cannot believe that he took upon him human nature. Christ was actually tempted not only by Satan in the wilderness, but all through his life from childhood to manhood. Christ assumed our fallen nature and was subject to every temptation to which man is subject. Even in his childhood, he was often tempted. Through life, he remained unyielding to every inducement to commit sin. When in his youth, his associates will try to lead him to do wrong, he will begin to sing some sweet melody. Praise the Lord. And the first thing they knew, they were uniting with him in singing the song. Temptation's gone. They caught his spirit and the name enemy was defeated. Music as a master tool to overcome sin. When music is not perverted, but it is used in its rightful way, then Satan cannot match it. Miscellaneous Collection, Sermons and Talks, Volume 2, Manuscript 80, 1903, Paragraph 12. If Satan knew that there was nothing within Christ that would gravitate to this temptation, it makes sense, any sense for him to even try to tempt him. What was Satan's objective? Would he have tried to tempt Christ if he knew it was futile? Would he not have used the ex exempted nature of Christ to strengthen his case that God is unfair and unjust? There was no point in Satan trying to tempt Jesus Christ if he didn't have our nature. The Son of God in his humanity wrestled with the very same fierce, apparently overwhelming temptation that assailed man. Temptations to indulgence of appetite, to presumptuous venturing where God has not led them, and to the worship of the God of this world, to sacrifice an eternity of bliss for the fascinating pleasures of this life. And how, when many are tempted, they succumb to these delusions. Why did Satan attack Christ to carefully and so powerful upon particular points? Satan showed his knowledge of the weak points of the human heart and put forth his uttermost power to take advantage of the humanity which Christ had assumed in order to overcome his temptation on man's account. This fallen for, we are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but principalities in high places. Satan's object in tempting Christ was to lead him to daring presumption and to show human weakness that will not make him a perfect pattern to his people. Satan thought that should Christ fail to bear the test of his temptation, there could be no redemption for the race and his power over them will be complete. I know the power of temptation. I know the dangers that are in the way. So Christ tells us in messages to the young people, tempted even as we are. Why should we not fall? perfect a Christ-like character? This is the question as I enter into the last segments of this presentation. We are enjoined to strive for perfection of character. The divine teacher says, be therefore perfect even as your father which is in heaven is perfect. Will Christ tantalize us by requiring of us an impossibility? Never, never. What an honor he confers upon us in urging us to be holy in our sphere. Christ doesn't want us to do something extraordinary. He just wants us in our sphere to be overcomers, as he was an overcomer in that sphere, as the Father is whole in his sphere. He can enable us to do this, for he declares all power in heaven is given unto me in heaven and in earth. This unlimited power, it is our privilege to claim. Temptations of Jesus Christ, doubt and fear. We have seen that presumption he went through, vanity and appetite and also he went through the temptations of the childhood. In his closing hours while hanging upon the cross, he experienced to the fullest extent what man experienced striving against sin. He realized how bad man may become by yielding to sin. He realized the terrible consequence of the transgression of God's law for the iniquity of the whole world was upon him. Man's Release, Volume 6, page 2, Paragraph 1. Christ was tempted by Satan in a hundredfold severer manner than was Adam, and under circumstances in every way more trying. Many claim that it was impossible for Christ to be overcome by temptation. You see that? And how do we, in some way, claim that Christ was uh, uh, 
uh, it was impossible for Christ to be overcome by the tempter, by giving him a power that we do not have, by making him look like a divine person masquerading as a human being, by making him actually uh, uh, using his divine powers to overcome, by making Christ have a different nature and, and a different overcoming formula than ours, then we make it, we, we, we make it, uh, we make God a liar and we say that Christ was, it was impossible for Christ to be overcome. But look, we are told, many claim that it was um, uh, impossible for Christ to be overcome by temptation. Then he could not have been placed in Adam's position. He could not have gained the victory that Adam failed to gain. If we have any sense, a more trying conflict that had Christ, then he will not be able to succor us. But our Savior took humanity with all its liabilities. What do you understand by liability? With its frailties and weaknesses. He took the nature of man with the possibility of yielding to temptation. So we find that it was not his divinity that was being tempted here alone. He was being tempted as a human being and he overcame as a human being. We have nothing to bear which he had. He has not endured. And he, ha he doesn't have a power which was advantageous to him that we do not have. All who are united with God can have the same efficacious power, the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to overcome sin. We need not to place the obedience of Christ by itself as something for which he has particularly adapted by his particular divine nature. No, it is not his divine nature, friends. For he stood before God as man's representative and tempted as man's substitute and surety, and his overcoming was the overcoming of humanity. Let us not place the obedience of Jesus Christ on his divinity. We will be giving Christ a power that is beyond what humans have. If Christ had a special power, which it is not the privilege of man to have, Satan would have made a capital of this matter. If Christ could have used his divinity, then we would be in problems. The obedience of Christ to his father was the same obedience that is required of man. Does man have divinity? No. Yes, Christ had divinity, but he never used it. Man do not have divinity, has to use humanity, lay hold on the hand of omnipotence by faith and then overcome. This is what Christ did and he overcame. Man cannot overcome Satan's temptation without divine power to combine with his instrumentality. So with Jesus Christ, he could lay hold of divine power. Praise the Lord, our higher calling, Christ humanity, golden chain, chapter 42, page 48, paragraph 6. So for Christ to overcome, he had to hold the divine power. For man to overcome, he has to hold the divine power. What method did Jesus use to overcome in this world? This is the question. We are looking at the temptation of Jesus Christ. How was he tempted? One, Christ took upon himself human nature, but daily he linked it with the divine nature. And we are told in 2 Peter 1, for unto us, we have been given exceeding precious promises that we may be partakers of the divine nature after uh, escaping the corruptions that are in this world. This is what Christ had. This is the hand that Christ held. He devoted all lines to prayer, leaving an example for all humanity. For as he relied upon God, the source of all strength, so are we to be invigorated and refreshed, to be strengthened for duty and braced for trial through communion with God. This is the secret of overcoming sin. Build a wall of scriptures around you and you will uh, see that uh, the world cannot break it down. Commit the scriptures to memory and then throw right back upon Satan when he comes with his temptation. It is written, this is the way that our Lord made the temptation of Satan and resisted them. Praise the Lord. Psalms 119, verse 9 to 11, wherewith can a young man uh, escape the corruptions on this world or overcome sin? With my heart I meditate upon thy laws. Verse 11, your word have I hidden in mine heart that I may not sin against thee. This is the way Satan was defeated. If you think there is any other formula for defeating Satan, then you will struggle with sin forever. As one with us, a sharer in our needs and weaknesses, he was wholly dependent upon God. And in the secret place of prayer, he sought divine strength that he might go forth breast for duty and trial. As a man, he supplicated the throne of God till his humanity was charged with the heavenly current that should connect humanity with the divinity. We are told that uh, although he was a son, 
he uh, offered up prayers to him who was able to save him from death and being perfected he became the author of uh, eternal life so as a man he overcame so as human beings we can overcome through continual communion he received life from god this is what we receive daily the impartation of jesus christ is an impartation of the holy spirit the impartation of himself that he might impart life to the world his experience is to be ours desire of ages 363 bear in mind that christ overcoming and obedience is that of a true human being in our conclusion we make many mistakes because of our erroneous views of the human nature of our lord when we give to his human nature power that is not possible for man to have in his conflict with satan we destroy the completeness of his humanity his imputed grace and power he gives to all who receive him by faith the obedience of christ to his father was the same obedience that is required of a man 6 mark page 341 for so much then as christ has suffered for us in the flesh arm yourself likewise with the same mind for he had suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin first peter 4 1 he came not to a world to give the obedience of a lesser god to a greater no christ was not a lesser god submitting to a, a greater god but as a man to obey god's holy law and in this way he is our example his overcoming is the overcoming of a man and this is what god expects from us the lord jesus came to a world not to reveal what god could do but what a man could do through faith in god's power to help in every emergency man is through faith to be a partaker in the divine nature and to overcome every temptation wherewith he is uh, be said our higher calling um page 48 paragraph 6 and uh, the lord jesus has bridged the gulf that sin has made he has connected with earth with heaven infinite man with the infinite god jesus the world's redeemer could only keep the commandments of god in the same way that humanity can keep them praise the lord praise the lord we are not to serve god as if we were not human he did not serve him like that but we are to serve him in the nature we have that has been redeemed by the son of god through the righteousness of Christ, we shall stand before God, pardoned and as though we had never seen. The humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. It is the golden chain that binds our soul to Christ and through Christ to God. And any researcher who will enter into this field to do the study will be blessed with the treasures of heaven. This is why we study the humanity, human nature of Jesus Christ. To find this golden chain of link between earth and heaven. This is the link that cannot be destroyed in their fallen nature people can do the very things god expects them to do through the help provide dead for them they can walk and work and live by the faith in the son of god god is not pleased with those who are satisfied with a mere animal life he has formed human beings after the divine similitude he designed that they shall possess the character of god by bearing his law the expression of his divine character Christ knew that Adam in Eden with his superior advantages might have withstood the temptation of Satan and conquered him. And so Christ doesn't come in the nature of Adam before the fall, but the nature of Adam after the fall. And so he, Jesus, also knew that it was not possible for man out of Eden, separated from the light and love of God, since the fall, to resist the temptation of Satan in his own strength. And that is why he uh, uh, gives the the, the perfect example of holding unto the hand of omnipotence by faith. And so the great work of redemption could be carried out only by the Redeemer taking the place of fallen Adam, not Adam before the fall. With the sins of the world laid upon him, he would go over the ground where Adam stumbled. Prevent Herald, February 24, 1874. We are to have an intense interest in Christ Jesus, for he is our Savior. He came to this world to be tempted in all points as we are to prove to the universe that in his world of sin, human beings can live lives that God will approve. And so those who overcome will follow the example of Christ by bringing the bodily appetites and passion under the control of enlightened conscience and reason. Those who overcome will follow the example of Christ. It is repeated. What is the example of Christ then? How did he overcome? We are told by bringing bodily appetites and passion under the control of enlightened conscience and reason. 
isn't she implying that Jesus had to do this? Bodily appetites and passion are not innocent infirmities or exempted nature. Bodily appetites are passion is what our nature possesses. The sparks that light the flame of temptation are enticement, deception, or influence blowing away from the lust. And so, Jesus Christ had a will and a mind as we have. As God, he could not be tempted, but as a man, he could be tempted and that strongly and could yield to the temptation. His human nature must pass through the same test and trial uh, Adam and Eve passed through. His human nature was created. It did not even possess the angelic powers. It was human, identical with our own. He was passing over the ground where Adam fell. A human body and a human mind were his. He was born of a bone and flesh of our flesh. He was subject to disappointment and trial in his own home among his own brethren. He was not surrounded as in the heavenly courts. This is Jesus. Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Luke 6, 38. That should be our prayer always. When situations seem so tempting, when we seem so drawn to the things of the world that uh, it seems impossible to overcome, let us pray that, Lord, the flesh is weak, the spirit is willing. Now give me the power that is needed to overcome this. This should be our prayer always, as Christ also uh, prayed in the wilderness of temptation in the Gethsemane. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me to do it. So Jesus Christ says, he did not come to do his own will but the will of the Father. Thank you, Sister Anne. The human will of Christ will not have led him to the wilderness of temptation. Do you sometimes feel discouraged even to go to a place to do missionary work, to face some criticism and to face some attacks and opposition? The human will of Jesus Christ will have not led him to the wilderness of temptation. Our human will cannot do that. And then we are told, let this mind that was in Christ be also in you, because it was a mind subject to the Father. To fast and to be tempted of the devil, the human will could not lead him there. It would not have led him to endure humiliation, scorn, reproach, suffering, and death. His human nature shrank from all these things as decidedly as ours shrinks from them. What did Christ live to do? It was the will of the Heavenly Father. Praise the Lord. The whole virgin shall be with a child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And so let us look at uh, the omnis that Christ had and how he used them as with flaws. But though Christ's divine glory was for time veiled and eclipsed by his assuming divinity, yet he did not cease to be God when he became man. Christ had not exchanged his divinity for humanity, but he had clothed his divinity with, in humanity. The divinity of Christ is our assurance of eternal life. And now, many have no real faith in Christ. They say it was easy for Christ to obey the will of the Father, he, for he was divine. But God's word declares he was tempted in all points like we are. Christ was tempted according to his elevation of mind, but he will not weaken or cripple his divine power by yielding to temptation. So he was tempted according to the elevation of his mind, his weaknesses as a man. In fact, we are told that his temptation was tenfold because humanity had, uh, uh, had uh, uh, intrinsically been tied with uh, divinity. And so how did he use his divinity? Because we say that, oh, Christ overcame because of his divinity. But we shall see that Christ never used his divinity. He was tempted but he overcame as a man. As we shall be looking tomorrow how he, he was able to overcome. We have just looked at the first segment in the last three presentations on Minneapolis history and the aftermath. That uh, Jesus Christ was tempted, was a human being really, and he was tempted as a man is being tempted, not as God is tempted, because Satan cannot tempt God. Satan can only tempt humanity. And so he tempted Christ in his humanity, according to the elevation of his mind. But then, how did he overcome? I pray that uh, we may really get the great picture 
in the issues that has to do with justification. And we are told that the humanity of Jesus Christ should be our study. Because in it, there is a golden uh, uh, chain that binds humanity with divinity. And so I pray that uh, the Lord may continue embracing the truth uh, as they are in his word. That uh, we may take Jesus Christ for who he is, and then we shall be able to get the strength even to overcome. And so may the Lord bless us as we go through this Sabbath. May your spiritual being be animated, and may the power and the appetite of knowing Christ be multiplied in our lives, so that we may have no other thing before us to seek, but we may have only Christ to seek in our lives. Above all, brethren, I wish you a uh, blessed Sabbath, and even as we wait upon the second coming of Jesus Christ, we may walk in the faith we have received. God, as we have read, does not demand of us to do something mysterious, but he just accepts the humble obedience from us as mere human beings. And uh, I like to close with this quote, which to me is uh, has always given me strength uh, in all that um, I have ever thought about. I'd like to close with this quote, a favorable quote of mine. This is uh, COL 333.1. Uh, this is the closing quote I want to share uh, with us. Let us think about this. As the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. Whatever is to be done at his command may be accomplished in his strength. All his beatings are his enablings. May the Lord be with us and may he guide us as we worship him on this Sabbath. Let us uh, bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I just want to say thank you we see that Christ overcame as a man. He was tempted as man is tempted and he was able to overcome. Now help us to have faith that also we can overcome and victory over sin is assured by Christ uh, uniting with humanity. And so help us not to have any erroneous idea that will not help us grow closer to thee. Father, we know that uh, truth sanctifies, but error does not sanctify. Help us to have truth for you say that sanctify them with the truth, thy word is the truth. Help us not to be spiritualistic about these things because spiritualism is at war with the plain statements of the Bible. Help us to take it as it reads and employ it in our lives and not any other artifact for overcoming sin. Thank you for thy love and thank you for thy grace. In Christ Jesus' name, amen.